This hearing will come to order. Today we will receive testimony from Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Jay Clayton regarding the work and agenda of the SEC. Your appearance before the committee, Mr. Chairman, is appreciated and it's essential to the oversight of the SEC. Now, I thank you for your willingness to testify today. The SEC has a critical mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. The SEC plays an important role in public confidence and trust in our nation's capital markets. It provides information to investors to ensure that as Americans prepare for their futures, they have the information necessary to make informed investment decisions. I commend the SEC for its work to advance these missions. Last week, this committee held a hearing to discuss the appropriate role of proxy advisory firms, the shareholder proposal process, and the level of retail shareholder participation. Many members expressed interest in continuing the discussion on the appropriate relationship between proxy advisory firms and market participants as it relates to shareholder proposals and corporate governance. I'm concerned about the misuse of, prox of the proxy voting process and other aspects of the corporate governance system to prioritize environmental, social, or political agendas over the economic interests of end investors. Last week, you stated your intent to address aspects of our proxy system, including proxy plumbing, ownership, and resubmission thresholds for shareholder proposals and proxy advisory firms. Many of the rules governing our proxy system have not been examined for decades, and I encourage the SEC to take an aggressive approach addressing the scope and appropriateness of previous regulatory actions. Capital markets are also vital to facilitating job growth and expanding American investment opportunities. This committee worked hard in the 115th Congress to pass a number of bipartisan securities and capital formations bills. I'll work to continue with members to identify additional legislative proposals that encourage capital formation and reduce burdens for small businesses and communities. The SEC has also taken a number of steps this year to make it easier for emerging companies to go public while not discouraging the availability of capital in the private market. Additionally, this year, the SEC proposed regulation best interest and a related interpretation to establish standards of conduct for broker-dealers and investment advisors. This is a significant step forward, and I look forward to seeing a final rule in the near term. Finally, the SEC has been proactive in addressing cryptocurrencies and coin offerings. For example, the Enforcement Division created a new cyber unit this year, which led efforts to counter fraud against retail investors involved in initial coin offerings and brought changes, or charges, excuse me, against a Bitcoin-denominated platform operating as an unregistered securities exchange. I look forward to receiving updates on these and other SEC initiatives, including your views on when we can expect final rules in these areas. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Chair, Chairman Grateful. Welcome, Chair Clay. Nice to see you again. Um, thank you for, the, uh, for, for your service. I, this, I assume this will be the last Banking Committee hearing for this Congress. I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation for the work of uh, Senators Donnelly and Heidkamp and Corker and Heller over the years. So thanks to all of them. Uh, we've discussed the SEC's enforcement program in previous hearings. In our recent meeting, um, Chairman Clayton, as you've highlighted, the SEC has worked hard to return money to harmed investors. I agree that's an important goal, but enforcement can't begin and end with protecting wealthy investors. Ten years ago today, Bernie Madoff was arrested. His giant Ponzi scheme was exposed. There's no doubt that Ponzi schemes still exist. Your enforcement report shows that SEC is focused on finding them and punishing the wrongdoers, as you should. We also know a decade ago, Bernie Madoff was far from the biggest threat to most families. It was Wall Street firms that had just wrecked our economy. And just as the SEC will continue to pursue Ponzi schemes, it must also continue to pursue, in many ways, the harder, the complex cases against the big banks when they break the rules and threaten families' home, homes and savings. I've said to this committee a number of times that uh, my zip code 44105, where Connie and I live in Cleveland, had more foreclosures in the first half of 2007 than any zip code in the United States. So I still see the remnants of inaction and wrong actions by regulators and by Wall Street. 
The big banks have not turned into angels over the last 10 years. Last month, German authorities conducted a two-day raid of Deutsche Bank's headquarters in a money laundering and tax evasion investigation. Last year, both the Fed and New York State regulators imposed fines totaling more than $500 million on Deutsche Bank's U.S. entity for anti-money laundering violations. And Deutsche Bank is not alone. Similar problems persist at other banks. Looking at your strategic plan, I see a lot missing. There's nothing about stock buybacks. There's nothing about excessive corporate debt. Take a look at what has happened since the Republican tax overhaul. Since last year, corporations have announced more than $1 trillion in stock buybacks, $1,000 billion, $1 trillion in stock buybacks. Take one example, GM has spent more than $10 billion on stock buybacks since 2015. Last month, on the same day it announced laying, on the last month it announced it's laying off 14,000 workers and closing five plants, including the Chevy Cruise plant in Lordstown, Ohio. Five, close to 5,000 lost jobs, 5,000 more jobs in the supply chain at least, and probably another 10,000 jobs in Mahoning Valley. The same day they laid off shift two several months ago, they announced they were expanding production in Mexico. Yet the stock buybacks continue and executive compensation continues to go up. The priority of these corporations are clear. Buying back shares boosts economies, a company's stock prices, which means even bigger bonuses for corporate executives. Investing in a company's workers supports the long-term health of the company, but that's not what Wall Street rewards. Our economy, our economy functioned fine without massive stock buybacks. The SEC rule facilitating buybacks was adopted 36 years ago, but since then, the size, the use, the frequency of stock buybacks has increased dramatically. My colleagues and I have asked you to take a look at that rule and ask probing questions as you do it. It's time to question whether it's too easy for companies to buy back their shares. The GM case shows us the risks to workers and communities when companies think only about short-term profits. We should be looking at the record levels of risky corporate debt and leveraged loans, how that debt is packaged in collateralized loan obligations, the complex securities that allow investors to trade pools of loans. The Fed and the OCC are looking at banks' exposure to leverage loans, but they say the risks are manageable and they're not worried. We've heard that one before. It was a little over 10 years ago before the economy came crashing down. Leverage lending, CLO investors include hedge funds, mutual funds, other market participants under SEC oversight. As the shadow banking market plays a larger role in leveraged lending. Watchdogs can't just focus on the big banks. It's your job to worry when it seems like there's nothing to worry about. And I will say that again, it's your job to worry when the public seems to think there's nothing to worry about. That's what consumers and investors expect so that risks don't build up across the financial system. A decade ago, the regulators in the Bush administration failed the country and the price was enormous. The SEC needs to be closely watching this market, not just to make sure disclosures and credit ratings are adequate, but to complement the work of the banking regulators. We know the financial system is more interconnected than ever and the systemic risks are, risks are more likely. Main Street can't afford for you to stand by watching Wall Street greed again every decade perhaps grow out of control. And any strategic plan for any agency guiding our economy needs to focus on the American workers who drive growth, not just wealthy investors. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. And again, again Chairman Clayton, we appreciate you being with us. You may proceed. Chairman Crapo, Ranking Member Brown, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about the work of the Securities and Exchange Commission. On behalf of my fellow commissioners and the 4,500 women and men of the SEC, I'd like to thank this committee for its support. Congress's funding of the agency enables us to improve our tools and expertise relating to our markets, capital formation, and protecting Main Street investors. Further, your interest in and engagement on our rulemaking and other initiatives have helped us refine and improve these initiatives, often to the benefit of our long-term Main Street investors. Thank you for your input. From a day-to-day -day management perspective, I see our job as having four principal areas of focus, protecting investors through forward-looking policies and rulemakings and through inspections and strong enforcement of our securities laws. Two, 
monitoring our disclosure-based capital markets and the numerous market participants, including through oversight of issuers, gatekeepers, and intermediaries. Three, ensuring that our trading markets function effectively and fairly, including during times of volatility and price discovery. And four, identifying, evaluating, and addressing emerging market risks. With regard to the fourth category, I want to note several key risks that are front of my mind. First, cybersecurity continues to be a pressing threat to our capital markets and many market participants. The SEC deals with cybersecurity risk through a number of perspectives, both within and outside the agency. Combating these challenges will continue to require significant resources and attention, as well as an understanding that this is both an entity-specific and a systemic risk. Second, the potential effects of Brexit on U.S. investors and securities markets and on global financial markets more broadly is a matter of increased focus for me and my colleagues at the SEC. In short, I believe that the potential adverse effects of a poorly executed Brexit are not well understood and in some, where, some areas where they are understood are underestimated. The SEC's responsibility is primarily related to the effects of Brexit on our capital markets and I have directed the staff to focus on the disclosures companies make about Brexit and the functioning of our market utilities and infrastructures. Third, managing the transition from LIBOR to a new rate such as SOFR is a significant issue for many market participants, including Main Street investors, as borrowers, for example, have consumer credit tied to LIBOR. We and our colleagues at the Federal Reserve, Treasury Department, and other financial regulators are monitoring this issue and working to facilitate a reasonable transition. However, an effective transition requires participants to take actions well ahead of year-end 2021 when the bank's commitment to submitting the information used to set LIBOR ends. Finally, the process for developing and implementing the Consolidated Audit Trail, or CAT, remains slow and cumbersome and significantly behind deadlines. According to the SROs, substantial delivery of the first phase of CAT is now not expected until 16 months after the initial deadline. While I believe the CAT should be completed with deliberate speed, protection of CAT data, particularly any form of PII, remains a threshold is issue for me. As the SROs continue to make progress in the development and implementation and operation of the CAT, I believe that the Commission, the SROs, and the plan processor must continuously evaluate their approach to the collection, retention, and protection of PII and other sensitive data. More generally, I've stated before, the SEC will not retrieve sensitive information from the CAT unless we need it and believe appropriate protections are in place to safeguard it. In closing, I would like to again thank the committee for its continued support of the SEC, its mission, and its people. I'd also like to note that my colleague, Commissioner Kara Stein, um, will be leaving us at the end of this year, and I thank her for co her contributions to the commission and to investors. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Clayton. Uh, I'll start out on the proxy voting process. It, that's been a focus of both the SEC and this committee recently. In your testimony, you note that there is consensus on the need for major overhaul of certain aspects of the proxy voting process, including proxy plumbing and proxy advisory firms. As staff recommends comprehensive overhaul proposals, what reforms can you enact in the short term, if any? Um, so with respect to proxy, I, I put this into, into three categories, um, Chair Crapo. Uh, for, first is proxy plumbing. Our, our proxy plumbing the, the voting from end, end investor back to the company is very complex, um, and the verification of that process, the facilitation of that process, does not work as well as it should. We're looking for short-term fixes. We're looking to the industry to propose them. So in that area, I'm looking for short-term fixes. We do need a long-term overhaul. In the area of shareholder voting, um, I believe there are things that we can do to that process that will not in any way diminish engagement, but will, what I would say, uh, eliminate unnecessary processes. Um, and then in the area of proxy advisors, I think that there's, I think there's broad agreement that there are elements of the proxy advisory 
what I'll call ecosystem that can be improved fairly quickly. And I'd be happy to discuss more detailed views. All right, I appreciate that. And uh, one, one last question for me. The, the SEC has devoted significant time and resources to issues surrounding digital assets and cryptocurrencies. Do you feel that the regulatory framework is sufficiently in place to provide certainty and predictability for market participants? So I, I want to I thank this committee for holding a hearing, I, I think it may have been nine months ago, on this very issue as the emergence of ICOs and cryptocurrencies um, became, I would say, uh, of broad interest to our investment community. Um, at the time, uh, Chairman Giancarlo and I noted that we thought the securities laws functioned well for securities, the commodities laws functioned well for commodities, and that to the extent there were crypto assets that fell outside either of those, for example, we talked about Bitcoin at that hearing, we should continue to monitor whether other laws, such as anti-money laundering and, and laws, needed to be supplemented. We're continuing to monitor that, um, but I, I very much appreciate this committee's attention to it and vigilance. All right. Th thank you very much. I'm going to yield back my time. We do have a vote coming up sometime after 11, maybe 11.15 or 11.30, so I'm going to yield back two minutes to help us meet that deadline. Senator Brown. Not that that's going to spread. Uh, yeah. No, I, actually, I'm setting a new standard, three minutes. I, I, I can hope. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Crapo. The, the banking regulators, recently banking regulators, have noted the risks in the leverage, um, leveraged lending market, but only well after the market is, has reached record highs. We've seen lending move outside the banking system and fuel the significant increase in collateralized loan obligations. What's the FEC doing to monitor the growth of risky loans outside the, the traditional banking system? So um, what I could say is uh, many months ago, and I don't want to say too many, but four or five, uh, we started looking at this issue in detail. And you touched on a number of things that we should be looking at in your opening remarks. So kind of from beginning to end, you've got issuers on the one hand, which, you know, do we have too much leverage at the issuer end of the spectrum? The companies borrowing too much money, too much increased leverage, um, all the way through to the end investors, whether it's mutual funds, pension funds, and the like. And there are entities in between, including rating agencies, um, banks, which originates the loans, and then what I'll call the CLO packagers, who buy the loans from the banks form the CLOs and send them to the end investors. We're looking at each component of that, and we're looking at it with two, uh, two ideas in mind. One is systemic risk. Are there, are there elements of this market that are going to cause the kind of systemic issues that you discussed, you know, knock-on effects? Um, one thing that we're looking at in particular is, will the change in ratings for these types of securities trigger substantial selling that wouldn't be picked up by ordinarily expected demand. You know, if you go from investment grade to below investment grade, do things like investment restrictions cause selling there where the credit really hasn't changed that much, but there's nobody there to pick it up? That's one of the many issues we're looking at. Um, I can go on for a long time. I don't want to take more of your time. That's all. Uh, let me shift to F FSOC is, um doesn't seem as engaged as many of us would like it to be. They've moved in the wrong direction by de de-designating the insurance companies that were deemed systemically important, as you know. As a member of FSOC, what are you doing to push a greater focus on leveraged lending and the interconnectedness of banks and, and shadow banks? Uh, well, the discussion that I was going through, the I would say the components of the CLO, I'll call it the CLO ecosystem, um, the leverage lending that's outside of the, CL, the, the, the traditional high yield debt market, bringing our knowledge and uh, what I would say continued analysis of that market to the other members of the FSOC is one of the things that we're doing. Well, and I'm hopeful that I, I, I guess I will ask you on the record, will you, will you commit to pursue these interests with, with, with the rest of FSOC? Is that something you will absolutely plan to do? Uh, I, I think it's, I, I generally try not to commit, but it's easy to commit for that because I'm already doing it. Okay, okay. That, that I, I can't, 
uh, yeah, I can't emphasize the underemphasize the importance of that. Um, yesterday, former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen said that corporate debt is at high levels and would prolong the damage of an economic downturn if it were to come or whenever it comes, leading to more corporate bankruptcies. I, I'm inclined to believe her. I hope you and other regulators uh, take the appropriate action as that says his corporate debt can, seems to continue to mount and continues to um, to play the role that it has in, in this economy. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for uh, coming back. Good to see you again. Um, you know, we've discussed in the past, including at uh, public hearing, that uh, we've had this amazing decline in the number of public companies in America, the number of IPOs that we launch in the United States. I, for one, think it's a terrible thing if people are choosing to finance their business through private capital uh, because of the costs uh, and regulatory uh, implications of going public. Obviously, a public company creates an investment opportunity for a Main Street investor. It creates another vehicle for capital raising. The competition between the public markets and the private markets ha have the effect of lowering the cost of capital. So in any way I can think about it, a very robust public equity markets is a very good thing for our economy. Um, I think in the past you've acknowledged that the regulatory costs of being a public company are probably a contributing factor to the relative decline and the absolute decline in public companies. Is, it still, is that still your view that that's a contributing factor? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it, one of my concerns is that, as we all know, there is a subset of activist shareholders who um, engage in forcing votes, shareholder votes, sometimes repeatedly on issues that they have no chance of succeeding on. Other times it's an effort to impose an ESG agenda uh, on a company. D does this activity contribute, do you think, in any way of a company's reluctance to go public? So, uh, I, I, look, I think, the, I think the answer to that question is, um, do, do, do the decision makers who decide whether a company should go public or not, um, when they look at that kind of activity, is it a check mark in the negative box? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That, that's, that's what I was getting at. Um, Vanguard is uh, headquartered in Pennsylvania. It's a great, great American success story, a great um, innovative institution that has made investing affordable for millions of mainstream investors. But Jack Bogle, the founder, recently made an interesting observation. He warned, and I quote, if historical trends continue, a handful of giant institutional investors will one day hold voting control of virtually every large U.S. corporation, end quote. Now, if the trend continues, which is Bogle's um, caveat, wouldn't that be a bad thing if a handful of institutional investors had voting control of virtually every large company in America? Um, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, the broader answer is a continued reduction in the number of public companies um, has, I would say, negative effects, I believe, has negative effects that go beyond just opportunities for Main Street investors um, to invest. A, a, a vibrant public capital market um, has has a number of other Absolutely. benefits to our society. Yeah, I mentioned some of them. Totally agree. Um, but but I, I do have this concern that we have uh, we have this regime that is discouraging companies from going public, and when they do go public, we've got processes that may result in votes being cast that are not really well aligned with the interests of the investors. One thing, just by point of clarification, former SEC Commissioner Dan Gallagher was here just last week, and he reminded us that it is perfectly permissible under existing law and regulation for a fund manager to come to the conclusion that it is not in the best interest of their investor clients to be voting on every uh, proxy matter. That's, that's factually correct, right? It's not required to, to have those votes. I, I, I saw um, former Commissioner Gallagher's testimony, and I think he described the staff position appropriately, yes. 
Um, so one idea that's been floated uh, as a way to increase the likelihood that when votes are cast, they actually reflect the wishes of the investor who is the ultimate um, shareholder, is uh, client-directed voting. Um, do you have an opinion on the, the merits of that? And is it your view, would there, are there any regulatory changes the SEC would need to make in order to facilitate client-directed voting? Um, so I, don't, I do not have a specific opinion today on client-directed voting. On the, on the core question of are the intermediaries, fund, fund managers or, or others, voting shares in the interests of their clients? That's something that was the subject of our roundtables. It goes to the question of regulation of proxy advisors, and it's something that I intend for the commission to continue to look at. Um, and I think we can. I think we can improve it. So, so you don't have an opinion on client-directed voting? Is that what I hear? I, I don't. I don't have one here today, Senator. It's like something I'd like to pursue with you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Before I move to Senator Reid, I'd like to notify the committee the vote has now been moved up to 11. I would like to finish by then. I want to congratulate Senator Brown for giving back a minute and a half and encourage everybody to really stay tight on your questions. Senator Reid. So you want me to be short? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See if you can beat my record. I gave two minutes back. I'll try. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Clayton. Uh, following up on some of the comments that Senator Brown made about share buybacks, um, not only um, is it difficult to, to look at GM, buy back significant stock, and then lay off thousands of workers. Uh, but your whole uh, approach has been for the long-term Main Street investor. And one of the options that GM had was investing in innovation, investing in more sophisticated products, and effectively they chose not to do that. Mm -hmm. They gave the money back. Uh, so this issue of, of uh, stock buybacks has several dimensions, one of which is not investing in the long-term future of the company. And is that something that concerns you, and is that something that the SEC can take steps to try to correct? Um, Senator, Senator Reid, I want to be clear about the SEC's authority. We, we do not have authority over capital allocation, over whether a company chooses to al allocate its capital by distributing it to its shareholders or investing. But I agree with a number of observers that in terms of how companies should communicate what they intend to do with their capital, um, we, can, we can do a better job around disclosure. So you have, what, what are your capital allocation decisions? Um, our disclosure rules are based on, I think, historic facts, plant property and equipment. How am I gonna spend my money on plant property and equipment? In today's economy, I think we should be driving disclosure more toward human capital, intellectual property, and the, the, the type of advantages we have from things like supply chain management, distribution management, and our relationships with other vendors. Th those are the things that drive companies' value today, and, and I would like to see our disclosures evolve toward that. But in terms of the SEC's role, as I understand it, please correct me, uh, this, uh, 36 years ago, you could not have these stock buybacks under SEC rules. Is that clear? I don't think that's correct. What, uh, uh, what, what happened 36 years ago was the SEC said, if you're going to buy back stock in the market, here's a way you can do it where if your intent is not to manipulate. There's no, there's no, um, there's no safe harbor if you're trying to manipulate. But if your intent is not to manipulate and you do it this way, you can feel comfortable that the buyback is being done without subjecting you to a claim of manipulation. Essentially what you did is provide a pathway uh, to buyback, which previously was considered somewhat risky because of the implications of inside information, of timing, of uh, self-aggrandizement uh, by the CEOs. So you do have the authority to look at that rule again. We do, but I just want to be clear what authority we have, which is the authority over whether to provide a pathway where you won't be, 
you will presume not to be manipulating the stock. Well, I, I, it's, not, again, it's not prohibiting or, 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 or I, allowing buyback. Again, I think given what we've seen is that you have to go back and sort of reroute that pathway, yeah. not only for modernization and innovation, but also because the choice for many individuals, I presume, and I, if I was in a position, I would certainly be thinking of this, is if I do a stock buyback, my stock options suddenly are hugely beneficial to me. Oh, and by the way, I'm, my pay based each year is on the value of the stock. So this could be so, nothing to do with the shareholders, nothing to do with the, the workers, nothing to do with the future of the company, but it's a pretty good payday for me. And that, I think, goes against the, you know, the you, notion you were, 36 years ago yeah, of let, manipulation. Let, let me say, I, I agree that if the purpose of the buyback is to drive the price up for the benefit of an individual. That's a problematic situation. And I just want to say I would encourage compensation committees um, who set compensation and structure compensation to look at that issue. Well, I have to give at least 20 seconds back. So I would encourage the SEC not deferring to the committees and the compensation committees, which are not that rigorous in many cases, to take strong and appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Good assertion by Senator Rounds. Thank you. In, in the interest of uh, following the chairman's lead, I'll ask just one question, and I'll submit several for the, for the record. In your written testimony, uh, you discussed the impact of Brexit on uh, the American markets. From a security standpoint, I've been following how Brexit could complicate the ability of American clearinghouses to compete in the EU and the UK markets. For U.S. clearinghouses to operate in the EU, EU authorities must determine that U.S. regulatory regimes are equivalent to the EU's. Otherwise, market participants would face higher capital charges for accessing American markets. Although the U.S. and the EU agreed that the CFTC's regime was equivalent in 2016, there has yet to be any determination for the SEC's regime. Progress in these areas is under threat, thanks to Brexit and legislation pending in the European Parliament. If that legislation passes, large American clearing firms would only be allowed to continue operating in the, EU, uh, in the EU if the EU regulators could jointly supervise them. Such legislation would violate the 2016 agreement, hurt American companies and taxpayers by making the market for U.S. Treasury bonds less liquid, and increase the cost of trading derivatives for farmers and ranchers. My question is, can you share your thoughts on the U.S. EU clearinghouse issue, and do you foresee any other regulatory challenges associated with Brexit and clearing securities? And if so, how would we work to resolve them? So, Senator, I, th I think your, your premise described the issue uh, very well. It's complicated. It requires um, international cooperation and recognition. And if we fail to um, identify a, what I will call a smooth path forward, there will be costs. Um, I've made that clear. Chairman Giancarlo has made that clear to our European counterparts. I know that they recognize it. Um, this is part of a broader issue. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm worried about Brexit is that there are a number of issues, just like the issue that you described, that seem to get kicked down the road as the broad issue unfolds. Do you see a format for resolving the issues? Um, pursuing several. Pursuing several. Can you um, share any thoughts? I, I, think I, I think I should leave it at that out of respect for the international nature of the negotiations, but this is, this is very much front of mind. Very good. Thank you. And I will yield back you, my Senator. two minutes and eight seconds. Okay, Senator Menendez. Uh, thank you. Can I take the <laughs> Senator Rounds two minutes and eight seconds? No. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. In your testimony, you state that you've made protecting Main Street investors a key guiding principle of your tenure at the SEC. So let me ask you, do you agree that Main Street investors were harmed by excessive risk taking on Wall Street in the years leading up to the financial crisis? I, I, I do. I think that excessive risk taking um, uh, in our markets in, 
let's just, let me just say this. Excessive risk taking in our markets from my perspective is more likely to have an adverse effect on Main Street investors than just about any other class of people. I agree with you. Do you agree that pay practices at big banks and financial institutions have at times ignored long-term consequences in favor of rewarding risky behavior to make short-term gains? Now, I don't, I don't want to make a general statement about those, but what I will agree with you on this, and I think it's your concept, is when, when you take someone's activity and you bring forward the benefits. So let's say, I, let's, say I'm a, let's say I'm working somewhere, and I do something that's going to last for five years. And then I say to you, hey, um, over the five years, this is going to make 100. So pay me a, based on 100 today. That type of um, incentive drives short-term behavior. Mm -hmm. Do you think Main Street investors might object to the fact that Wells Fargo CEO Tim Sloan was paid $17.4 million last year, the same year other regulators investigated and took actions on scandals relating to the bank's auto lending, mortgage lending, and investment management practices? Uh, Senator, I'm not going to comment about a specific um, institution here in this forum. Well, okay. So do you think in Main Street investors might object to the fact that any CEO would be paid, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, after that they face all of those investigations and all of those consequences for fraudulent behavior at their institution? I, I, I do think that investors in companies should have clear disclosure of what the senior executives of those companies are making, and they should have input through various engagement processes, including um, some of the processes that we've discussed here today. Um, so with that in mind, why send, is send, it, send in a word, I'm sorry. Send in a word, there should be accountability. Good. Why is it then that the commission has not made it a priority to finish congressionally mandated rules to rein in pay practices that put Main Street investors at risk? I, you're, you're speaking about the Dodd-Frank um, mandates around um, pay practices, yes. I believe. Yeah, yes. I, I am aware of those. I keep track of the Dodd-Frank mandates. I am pursuing them, uh, working with my fellow commissioners. We proposed rules around some of those. We're reviewing the comments. Um, we received a number of comments. Some of them raised very um, significant issues. Um, that's what well, I can, can you give me a time frame in which you would expect the commission actually to be able to promulgate I have rules the, in this regard? I have the hedging rule on our near-term agenda. I expect that in the near term. Um, the others, I can't be as precise. Well, let me just say that uh, if we agree in principle that runaway executive pay, which rewards risk-taking, can be harmful to investors, and you have a mandate from Congress to do something about it, it just seems to me that this should be a priority. It falls right in line with your Main Street investor priority. So I, I hope you will make it such at the end of the day, and I hope the next time you come before the committee, we will have rules promulgated. Let me ask you one other question. I read your statement issued on Friday regarding the SEC's difficulties assessing information about Chinese companies that are listed on U.S. exchanges. There are 224 companies listed on U.S. exchanges with a combined market capitalization of $1.8 trillion that are located in countries, primarily China, that make it difficult for U.S. regulators to review their financial reporting. This presents a major risk to U.S. investors who may assume that the financial reporting of these companies is in line with U.S. requirements. Moreover, it's fundamentally unfair for Chinese companies to take advantage of the strength and liquidity of U.S. capital markets, but don't have to play by the rules. The U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission recommended that Congress consider legislation providing authority to ban and delist companies that have refused to sign reciprocity agreements with the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Despite the SEC and the board's best efforts to reach an agreement, it appears unlikely that Beijing will cooperate. Would such authority strengthen your hand in negotiations with your Chinese counterparts? Uh, let me say this, Senator. I, th I think your characterization of where we are, which there are information barriers um, to us receiving what I would say is the same information 
and the PCOB receiving the same information that we would expect to receive in other jurisdictions that exist today? Yes, are we working through those? Yes, um, I'm not prepared to uh, support a specific um, remedial action in this form, but we need to make progress. Well, we, we can, I'll just close on this note. We can continue this process. $1.8 trillion investors under your own previous statement about our other set of line of questions about transparency mm -hmm. should have transparency to know that these companies are living up to the standards for which investors rely upon to make investment decisions. And that, that transparency is why we put the statement out. People, people should know where, the, where we sit today and know that we need to improve. Yeah, but it, all it will say is that we, we, we don't know exactly what the what their accountability is. We just know that there is an accountability. So at the end of the day, you should, I, I would hope the commission would embrace us giving you the tools to get the Chinese and other companies similarly situated to disclose. Thank you. Mr. Senator Chairman. Kennedy. Mr. Chairman, thanks for being here. I think you're doing a great job. Mr. Chairman, would you buy a bond issued by a state if you didn't know if, whether they were broke or not? Um, no, I would not. Okay. I, I, I read uh, you gave a speech recently. I was reading it the other night. It was very good. One of your statistics says the issuers, that states, municipalities, et cetera, who file either annual financial information or audited financial statements within 12 months of their fiscal year, um, do so on an average of 100, 188 and 200 days after the end of the fiscal year. So, so, so their financial statements between 188 and 200 days left. Mm -hmm. um, why, why is MSRB allowing that to happen? Are they doing anything over there other than standing around and sucking on their teeth? Um, I'll, I'll just what, what I'll say is I uh, this is this is the reason I gave that speech um, is I think this is an area that needs to improve. Um, the first step in improving it is to make sure that investors understand that the financial statements they are looking at, in some cases, are 18 months old. Yeah, well, that's let me, pretty, let that's, me ask that's you, pretty old. Let's suppose that, that, that you're an individual investor, okay, and you want to research the bonds, aside from the fact MSRB, which is supposed to regulate themselves, um, you, want to, you, want, you want some information about, about uh, the bond issue or about the state. Are you aware MSCRB charges 60,000 bucks to download bulk data? Um, actually, I was not aware of that, Senator. Would you look into that for me? I, I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, do you need disgorgement of ill-gotten gains, gains to do your job? Um, I, I, I think you're referring to the effects of the Kokesh Supreme Court decision. Yes. Um, I, I believe that the Kokesh Supreme Court decision um, we, we need some help. We need some help. Because what it did was it said, um, basically, Ponzi schemes and other types of frauds like that that go on beyond five years, we're not able to reach back and get the money back for people who were victim of those, of those schemes. Because disgorgement was viewed in that case as a penalty subject to the five-year statute of limitations. Uh, and you don't have that authority now? We, we, we do not have the authority in those Only Congress can give you that authority. I'm, I'm not going to be a lawyer here, but yes. Okay. Let me ask you one final question. Uh, are you familiar with the, uh, the Stanford case where Alan Stanford um, stole $7.2 billion in a Ponzi scheme from about 21,000 people? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> we're doing great getting the money back from Bernie Madoff and his people. We've collected over 75 cents on the dollar. We aren't doing as well with, with Stanford. We've, we've clawed back $431 million and the lawyers took $226 million. Um, SEC took a position to oppose a motion to eliminate uh, the restriction of filing voluntary bankruptcy, which will help the people get their money back. Why did the SEC do that, and would you reconsider? Um, I know I'm catching you cold. No, no, you're catching Just trust cold. me. It would be a good idea. How about I'll say I trust you? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to yield back one minute and 17 seconds, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. And uh, uh, before I go on, 
uh, for some of those who have just arrived, we have a vote at 11 o'clock. And I've been encouraging all members to shrink down their questioning. Three of them have given back a minute or two. Four, uh, counting me, four of them have given back a minute or two. So you don't have to, but please help us get there. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you again, Chairman Clayton. As you know, right now, investment advisors are subject to what's called a fiduciary standard. That means they're legally required to put the financial interests of their clients ahead of their own interests. Brokers who get a commission for every trade that they make follow different rules. And in fact, they can recommend a product that boosts their own commission, even if it isn't the best deal for the customer. And we also know that brokerage firms artificially create all sorts of perverse incentives to encourage brokers to make certain recommendations that are very profitable for the firm or for the broker, even if they aren't real good for the customers. So that's a problem. And in April, the SEC proposed some new rules for brokers. Now, Mr. Clayton, as you've told me before, the idea behind these new rules is to help regular retail investors, you like to call them uh, Mr. and Mrs. 401k, to make informed choices, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's one component of it. We, there are several components of the rule. Okay, but it's trying to help investors make informed choices, right? That's A what this is about. Absolutely. Okay. So one option would simply be to make brokers subject to the same fiduciary standard that investment advisors are subject to, but you didn't do that. Instead, the SEC's proposal says that brokers have to act in the best interests of the client, but then you never define what best interest actually means. So here's where I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. For the proposal to help customers make good decisions, they need first to understand the difference between a broker and an investment advisor, and second, how the fiduciary standard for investment advisors is different from the best interest standard for brokers, which is something you don't define. Do I have that right so far? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think we're pretty clear on what the best interest standard, and we're going to be clear. On uh, you're saying standard. you do define it in the rules? The best interest standard, as we've proposed, means that you as a person. I'm sorry, is it defined in the rules? Is there a specific definition that says this is what it means? No, but there's no okay. specific definition that says this is what the investment advisor so, standard means. So I just want to be clear then. Anybody who's trying to figure this out first has to figure out do you have a broker or an investment advisor? And then secondly, they have to figure out, depending on which one you have, what the difference is between the fiduciary rule and the best interest test. Is that right? Otherwise, you can't... Almost, because you, have to, you also have to understand the relationship. There, there are, there are, you've, you've got to excite, but there's, there are three components. To it. The advisor relationship, the, the reason it's important to understand who you're dealing with, whether it's a broker or an advisor, is the advisor relationship is a portfolio relationship. Okay. With you've got two, and you're just telling me it's even more complex than that. All that's, I want that's to get to... That's where we sit today. You can't start. I know. And we could have fixed that by just giving everybody the same rule, but we didn't. Well, so here's the question. You've got to start with the difference between an investment advisor and a broker. The SEC has done a study on this, mm -hmm. and your own data show that a lot of investors have no idea what the difference between brokers and investment advisors is and the legal standards that are different for each of them. Your Office of the Investor Advocate commissioned a study of whether investors could figure out these differences based on the standard disclosures that you gave them, mm -hmm. and the bottom line was they can't. I don't have time to go through every example in the study, but I picked one out. One participant told an interviewer, after reading side-by-side -side descriptions of the best interest and the fiduciary standards, I don't know, it's basically the same language, but um, the same they just kind of word it differently. Yeah, so it's pretty much the same. But of course, the standards are not the same, which is the whole point here. When your own study shows that disclosures don't work to help regular investors make informed decisions, will you move away from a disclosure-based approach in your final rule and just adopt a uniform fiduciary standard for both advisors and brokers as Congress instructed in Section 913 of Dodd-Frank? That's a good summary of where we are. Let me, good. Let me, let me tell you what we're Thank doing. Thank you. No, it's very good. Um, let me tell you what we're doing. The advisor standard, and I'm going to call it the baseline advisor standard because advisors are allowed to contract around this standard. It's not well known, 
this is something that we want people to understand. The baseline advisor standard is the advisor cannot put their interests ahead of the client's interests. Now, they are, they are able to say, you know, but I'm going to do these things, and with informed consent, they can cut back on that standard. That's not well understood. We want that to be understood. But on the broker side, the, fund, the fundamental duty is going to be that the broker cannot put her or his interests ahead of the client's. So it's the same, but it's a different well, but if it's, it's a the different same, let me, let me suggest, Mr. Chairman, if it's the same, just use the same words. We may do that. Because when you're not using the same words and, in fact, trying to give a description so that people have to sort out which of the two kinds of people they're dealing with and how the standards differ from each other, mm -hmm. it means the disclosure's not working. Look, we've had study after study after study that shows that pages of disclosures don't work. And even if people read the disclosures and they can't make heads nor tails from it, now your own study mm -hmm. reaches exactly the same conclusion. You know, the inference I, I, I draw from this is that we need a clear, uniform fiduciary standard for advisors and brokers. It's the only way to make sure that people who are me, trying to save for their kids' college education or their retirement are getting the advice that is best for them instead of what's most profitable for the person giving the advice. I, I, I believe, oh, sorry, good. It's okay. We I'm need to, we need to shut Chairman. it down. Okay. Thank you. Senator Corker. Before, well, I just want to thank Senators Donnelly and Corker for their service on this committee. Um, so thank you, Joe, very much. And I join, it, I join in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Been a great privilege, really has. I'm going to be very brief and defer to Senator Cotton because I know the Chairman and Ranking Member want to uh, um, have this end at an appropriate time, and we've got a lot of other things happening. I'd, I've got had the opportunity to get to know our chairman, uh, both prior to him being confirmed and throughout the process. I just want to say I'm really proud of what he's trying to do at the SEC. I'm proud of his leadership. I know that he's acting in an independent manner, uh, which I appreciate very much, and I wish him well as he continues, and all those on the committee as you continue to wrestle with issues relative to our financial system. And with that, thank you, and I'll defer to Cotton. Thank you, Senator Cotton. I know we get to work that way. Thank you. Senator Corker, um, Chairman Clayton, I want to discuss with you the SEC gag rule on settlements. It was addressed in a Wall Street Journal uh, opinion piece on November 14th. Um, here's how Judge Jed Rakoff from the Southern District referred to them in 2011. The result is a stew of confusion and hypocrisy unworthy of such a proud agency as the SEC. The defendant is free to proclaim that he has never remotely admitted the terrible wrongs alleged by the SEC, but by gosh, he had better be careful not to deny them either. Here, an agency of the United States is saying, in effect, although we claim that these defendants have done terrible things, they refuse to admit it, and we do not propose to prove it, but will simply resort to gagging their right to deny it. The disservice to the public inherent in such a practice is palpable. Could you explain to the committee what public interest the gag order on discussing settlements with the commission serves? Uh, it has been an effective means to reach a settlement um, that, is, that is in the interests of the public. In that, let me just say that if we can settle matters quickly, we can move on to look at other matters. And the no admit, no de deny approach has enabled us to get to settlements that get people their money back, get bad actors out of the marketplace, and, uh, and draw a line under that matter. So it, it, has, it has been an effective means of pursuing remedies. One might also say it allows a company and an agency who have both failed in a particular matter to conceal that failure from the public as well. It's not the right approach in every matter. So there's a wrinkle in the rule that says if a defendant who has reached a settlement is under one of these orders testifies in a court of law that he is no longer bound by that gag order, which implies that the gag order might require him to say something untruthful. What's your thoughts on that wrinkle? Um, I, I think that's a, a um, how, how would I say this? It's a um, result of... Uh, the unique nature of testifying um, in those types of situations. So it's, it's okay to have defendants who have reached a settlement with the SEC say things to the public that might be untruthful, but not say them in court? 
And we're talking about a prior restraint on speech mm -hmm. that is also content-based, mm -hmm. the most disfavored kind of regulations under Supreme Court First Amendment precedent. They require a compelling government interest in a, the most narrowly tailored means. Look, we, we all know that the First Amendment um, you know, doesn't, doesn't permit all speech without sanction. You can't commit fraud um, you know, using words. Um, I think the, this was developed um, in part to um, restrict somebody who had done prior wrong, or we think had done prior wrong, from telling people, pay no attention to that. It doesn't, you know, and when you're dealing with somebody in the securities industry, uh, their history is something that is of relevance. Well, the, they can say that they didn't commit what was alleged against them. They just can't deny the allegations that were made. Mm -hmm. this were, I, know, I know this is not a Jay Clayton initiative. It goes back since before I was born, but it's come under criticism for a very long time. Do, I mean, do you think that this gag order has First Amendment problems? Um, I you personally. I th I, my, me personally? Uh, I, I think that we have a long history of, um, of uh, people agreeing uh, to restrict uh, certain things that they can say in the commercial arena. Okay. My time has almost expired. Um, thanks for the exchange. I, I think the SEC probably needs I didn't know this was going to be a con law class. Yeah, I, I think the SEC should I'm probably struggling. reconsider it. Um, I mean, it was passed at a time in 1972 when First Amendment precedent was much different mm -hmm. and, frankly, more favorable to the government than it probably should have been. Mm -hmm. I understand the points that you're making about public interest, mm -hmm. but I do think it's, it's quite overbroad. It's not at all narrowly tailored anymore, and, and it can undermine other legitimate public interests. I understand. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to pursue some of the questions Senator Reid had on uh, stock buybacks, uh, because the claim that many made at the time that the big tax cut uh, was passed was that companies were going to use all this extra money that they got from their tax cuts to invest in more plant and equipment and wages increasing for their workers. And the evidence is overwhelming that, in fact, they used and are using that money for stock buybacks. We're up to $800 billion in stock buybacks today since the passage of the bill. Now, we can all debate uh, the merits of a stock buyback, but as I understand your testimony, you agree that if executives are using stock buybacks to elevate the price of their stock and then quickly cash out their own compensation, that would be a problem from your perspective. Is, am I understanding you correctly? Well, let, me, let me clear what I said is, Sen Senator Reid um, and, and, and also others said, you know, if the motivation is driven by the compensation scheme, yeah. I think that that's so something. So let me ask you I this. I think that's something compensation committees ought well, to Well, let me ask you this. That's, so there's mounting evidence that, that executives are cashing out more frequently after a stock buyback than before. Well, I, I mean, there's been evidence that. Uh, in fact, twice as many companies have insiders selling in the eight days after a buyback announcement as sell on an ordinary day. Would that trouble you if that was a pattern? You know, I saw that stat, and it's kind of interesting. The, the question there is, are the announcements coincident for the window where they're actually permitted to sell their stock? So, you know, I think, I think a little more work needs to be done on that. So if the only time you can sell as an executive is right after earnings are announced, which is most, then if you, if you needed to sell as part of your, your planning, I, I, it's gonna be coincidental. I just, I, you, it's possible the data is wrong, but if the data is no, correct, the data, you're, you're finding right, you're right. though, but, but those, in other words, if it's happening a lot more frequently in this period, right after, in the eight days after stock buybacks, I don't, I think that would be a problem. But let me, let me just ask you this. Um, would you be willing to have a host a roundtable discussion to look into this issue? So, let, let, me, let me say this. I'm, I'm happy to continue to discuss this issue. I don't want to commit to a roundtable, but okay. the SEC's role in this is clearly something that people are focused on. I want to be as clear as I can about what our role is. So I'm happy to continue the conversation um, to bring clarity. But, but I understood, and we, a number of us wrote you a letter on this. I understand your position with respect to decisions that have to be made by corporations for the good benefit of their shareholders. But what we appear to be seeing is a pattern where more executives are cashing out when they've had stock buybacks, which, which boosts the price. And 
that would be decisions made for their own benefit as opposed to the stockholders. So I would like to pursue this because you have, as you know, hosted a roundtable on something which I think is a lot <laughs> less of a priority, which is proxy uh, shareholding. And I, I just, you know, where you've chosen to focus your efforts, I think is um, a little bit troublesome. But let me just ask you this on shareholder voting, proxy shareholder voting. Uh, because um, we had an earlier hearing on this, and I mentioned a statement a let from T. Rowe Price, which is a Maryland-based company, mm -hmm. uh, that is on both sides of the shareholder uh, mm -hmm. proxy issue, right? They're an institutional client to proxy advisory firms, mm -hmm. um, but they're also an issuer of um, uh, where others use proxies to decide whether to purchase, uh, uh, how to cast their votes with respect to T. Rowe Price. And what they say very clearly in this letter is that they think that the requirement, requirements that proxy firms mm -hmm. run their advice or proposals or concerns through the corporations first would actually significantly diminish the value of that advice mm -hmm. to T. Rowe Price. Do you agree that we should not be dictating to uh, the market that these proxy advisors have to somehow show uh, the executives or the corporations uh, their information before they give it to the clients who are paying for it. So, I, I'm I'm certainly not wedded to that improve that that method of improving the process. There is a there is an issue in the process, which is the proxy advisory firm comes out with their analysis, um, and the company wants to respond, and you have to look all over the place. It would be nice if you could see the responses side by side or something else like that. But I'm not I'm not wedded to running it through the company before it's published. Okay, I just find it curious. We've had people advocating here that um, a firm like T. Rowe Price just doesn't know what it's doing and it needs uh, this extra step in order to make good decisions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, we have 10 minutes left in the boat. We can either, uh, I'll be glad to recess and come back for those that want five minutes, but I understand that a number of you are willing to avoid that by just going a couple of minutes. Is Chairman, I'll ask just one question. Okay, uh, go ahead. Chairman Clayton, thank you for being here. The Consolidated Audit Trail will be the second largest database in the world, and it will be a repository for both personally identifiable information and sensitive trade data. As such, this CAT will be a major target for cyber criminals and other bad actors. <coughs> Broker dealers will be required to report consumers' personally identifiable information to the CAT and then rely upon the security measures uh, set up by CAT operators. What is the SEC doing to require that CAT operators will provide prompt and accurate notification of a data breach? And how will the SEC assure that broker dealers are not held liable by their customers for data breaches caused by the CAT? Uh, what, I, what I can tell you, Senator, is I think all three significant issues in your question are things we're focusing on, including whether retail customer PII is actually going to go into the CAT or whether we're going to do something, a hashing is the technical term, and that's about as much as I know about hashing, um, to ensure that the data that, that goes into the CAT is not PII for those, for those retail investors. Um, and then in terms of issues around liability, um, I'm not gonna speak about who, who owes what to whom and what the law applies, but we're, we're sensitive to those issues. Uh, with the time constraints, perhaps we can have this conversation yep. in my office or your office as well. Happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Moran. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman, for being here. Uh, I want to follow up on a conversation we had just about a year ago. The SEC issued guidance in 2010 on climate risk. Mm -hmm. uh, many in the investment community, like BlackRock and Bloomberg, have called these disclosures inadequate. Currently, less than half of America's largest companies even make these disclosures. In October, a group of investors representing $5 trillion in assets, 15 leading securities, law professors sent a petition to the SEC arguing that improved disclosure rules would increase market efficiency and that the SEC has the authority to issue such rules. Yesterday, a group of 415 investors that represent 32 trillion in assets ha wrote that governments need to act on climate change and they specifically say it is vital that governments commit to improve climate-related financial reporting standards. Um, I thought we had a good conversation mm -hmm about this. I thought you expressed a willingness to work on this. I have seen no evidence um, that you are working on this. And what little evidence I've seen uh, goes to the contrary in terms of the shareholder proposals, which are, are putatively not about climate. It's just that every example given 
in um, raising thresholds for shareholder action is about climate. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do to make sure that publicly traded companies disclose climate risk? So our, our division of corporation finance, which reviews public company filings, this is one of the issues that they are reviewing filings for. They make company specific comments, ask company specific questions. We're doing that. Um, I've, ha I've been in discussions with our head of Corp Fin, uh, Bill Hinman, about whether we should do more, um, what that would be. They are sandbagging, and I will leave it there. We'll follow up uh, for the record. I, I'd, like a, I'd like a meeting in person. I understand that they're working in good faith, but they view this as an ideological question, and eight years later, this is very clearly an issue of economics. And there was a point at which you could say, well, you know, we can't measure this, we can't know this, this is not short term. None of that is true anymore. All of this is provably an economic question. And in the interest of time, I don't mean to cut you off. I will uh, uh, happy, happy yield back. Yeah. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Chairman, it's good to see you again. I want to jump back to the uh, best interest standard mm -hmm. um, that you were talking with Senator um, um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Elizabeth Warren about. Um, first of all, I, I supported the Department of Labor's fiduciary standard, and if you don't know, Nevada is the first, I think, state in the country that passed a, a state statutory fiduciary duty requirement for broker-dealers. Uh, I'm curious, with respect to the proposed regulation that was just introduced by the SEC, under that proposed regulation, can, can brokers create sales incentives uh, for recommending certain products to its customers, to their customers? The short answer to your question is some sales incentives, like growing assets under management or total assets, you would think you would compensate somebody for bringing in new customers and growing assets, just like happens in the investment advisory space. But there are some, there are some activities like that that I believe, and I'm speaking for myself, not for the commission, that I believe are inconsistent with putting the clients, putting, not putting your interests ahead of the clients, high-pressure product-specific sales contests. Um, I've been clear, they, they don't work for me. This, get, the, get this out the door. And I agree I, with you. Let me, because for, for the interest of time, I agree with you. But I, I think, isn't it true that just any incentive works against the best interests of the client? Well, I don't think so. Because if what you're doing is saying to a broker, hey, if you, if you now have $100 million, for example, and you grow it to $200 million, um, you should make more money. Um, I think that's okay. That's the way the investment advisory firm works. If you're managing a pension plan for someone and you get another pension plan to manage, um, you may get paid more. I, okay. think, I think that's okay. Let me ask you this. Does the proposal, um, can brokers create bonuses for recommending certain products to customers under this proposal? I, I think it depends on the, the structure. Again, there's but, another opportunity for somebody to make money uh, that in really in reality, they're supposed to be looking at the best interests of the uh, mm -hmm. client, but there's now an incentive for them to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always found, and I was a former attorney general, mm -hmm. that when you put those incentives there, um, it, it really erodes looking out for the best interest of the client. And that's my concern. So let me jump to, to one final thing, because in that conversation with uh, um, Senator Warren, you talked about the potential, and I, I, did I hear you correctly that um, when she talked about defining the best interest standard um, and looking out for that fiduciary relationship, you said that this proposal may use the same words uh, for defining a fiduciary. Is that correct? What did you mean by that? What, what I mean is, what I, what I just said to you is that the, the, the bedrock principle is that I can't put my interests ahead of my client's interests. And, and that, that's, that, that to me is pretty clear. Yeah. And so that means no bonus, no incentive, nothing should be looking out for your own interests over somebody else's. Well, I guess get, that's my you concern. You have to get paid. Well, that's different. That's and, different. And, and, and I've engaged a lot with investors around this just to hear what they think. And, and they, they recognize that people should get paid. What they don't want are hidden incentives or incentives that are clearly inconsistent with making a recommendation that's in the interest of the client. Okay, I, for the interest of time, I, I appreciate uh, you coming here today. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Clayton, thank you for uh, coming today. Real quickly, you have been an outspoken about the need for disclosures for companies that face unpredictable risks, such as Brexit, which seems to be becoming 
more unpredictable by the hour. Um, cybersecurity is also another one. And this recently, um, the SEC issued uh, guidance on cybersecurity disclosures. Um, and I'm hoping that the SEC doesn't lose focus. Uh, what I want to ask, there were a couple of, of your uh, colleagues that thought that the, the uh, guidance didn't quite go far enough. And I'm just get, wanted to know if you could talk briefly about what you're seeing from companies about after the guidance was um, issued and if there are other improvements for these disclosures, disclosures that you think might be prudent going forward. Um, I've discussed those issues with my colleagues and understand, I, I think that they understand how difficult it would be to be more precise. Right. So put there. For a long time, I thought that the disclosure was not where it should be in terms of what the real risk was. I think we've seen improvement. We've seen improvement in, okay, here's the general risk, and we've seen some improvement in reporting when you have an issue. And when I say the general risk, how that general risk applies to your company. Um, I'd like to see more disclosure around what companies are doing to minimize that risk. Right. Are we collecting less data? Are we looking at how we operate our business so that you know, you're less susceptible and, and are, are now not just looking within inside the company, but looking at your vendors and suppliers and, and data that comes in from the outside that if corrupted, creates a risk for you. Um, it, it's, it's increasing in terms of sophistication, right. um, but we have a ways to go. And I assume it's, it, uh, am I correct, and this can be just yes or no, I'm assuming it's a work in progress for the SEC. Yeah, this is a work in progress. It's a work in progress for our economy. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Clayton. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jones. And that does wrap up the questioning. Um, thank you for being here today, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the work that you're doing. For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due on Tuesday, December 18, and I encourage you, Mr. Chairman, to respond to them promptly. This is our last hearing for this Congress. We've had a lot of productive hearings, and I thank all of our senators for making that happen. I especially want to, as has already been done, uh, thank Senators Corker, Heller, Heitkamp, and Donnelly for all the work they've done on this committee. We will miss them. With that, this hearing is adjourned.